works and then the sword of the Spirit. And it is in uh, verse uh, 17. <clears throat> Uh, Ephesians 6 and 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And the sword is both at aggressive and defensive, as you know, you know. Uh, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And it's such a massive verse that it's hard to meet the challenge of it at all, you know the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Probably it's something the same as we each experience when we make a quick note of something that we've heard, you know. Uh, I don't know how much it happens to you. I'm surprised in a way how much it happens to me. A vision in the night, you know, that whole thing, you know. He gives us songs in the night. But how clear things can be to you in the middle of the night when you are undistracted by the world and undistracted by what your eyes see and your ears hear. And it's remarkable how clearly God can speak to you at that time. And you may have had the experience that I often have. I, I, if I don't write the thing down, it's remarkable how it can be gone by the morning but certainly by the morning to get it written down. Uh, it's as if you want to try to hold the truth that you saw and have it in a visible form so that you can call it to your mind again. And of course it's a mystery because the thing itself is a revelation of light through the Holy Spirit to your spirit and often virtually bypasses your mind. So often, of course, you can form the words to remember it but uh, whether those words call it up or not is a different matter because it's the work of the Spirit to bring back to your remembrance the things that he has spoken to us. And so most of us have probably some experience of that. Either through the night we get a revelation from God or we hear something that somebody said or we read something that somebody wrote and we write it down in our commonplace book or in our little uh, uh, XDA. But we somehow put it down hoping that we'll be able to reproduce that perception of reality again. And of course it's a tricky thing to do because you're very conscious it's not the words themselves. However carefully you choose the words, it's not the words themselves that bring to you the whole feeling inside that that light from God originally brought you. It's really his spirit. And of course, that's part of the mystery of the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Part of the mystery of this is, it is not just what it appears, you know. It's not just a book of print. It isn't. It's not just a book of written words. It somehow has a spirit about it. It has somehow an ability to bring God's spirit into your own heart. And so when you talk about the sword of the spirit, the word of God, you're not really just talking about Tab Biblia, the Bible, you know. You're talking about a mysterious part that the book has that even people like Coleridge, who weren't terribly Christian poets, you know, they say he said, the Bible finds me at a deeper depth of my being than any other book. And uh, again and again, people who aren't particularly godly people, who aren't really Christians, they will admit there is some kind of power in the words of this book that come to a deeper part of your being than any other book. And many people will say, you know, books that are talked about as inspired, they get their inspiration from the one book that is inspired and that is breathed into by the breath of God. And so when we talk about the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, you're not really just talking about the book itself. You're talking about a, a factor that nobody can quite tie down, but thousands and thousands of people, of writers, 
tie their own inspiration back to this book. And so it is true that when you open it and you deal with it in your Bible study or you open it in your mind, you seem to be touching something more than words. And it seems to put you in touch in some way with the Spirit of God that originally breathed life into it. And it seems to in some way be a book of life. So undoubtedly, you know, when they hand this to Queen Elizabeth, and you would know the words, but take thou this, you know, the most precious thing this world possesses. They often mean something other than this thing. And really, I would be the first to say it's just a book, you know. There's nothing special about it. but. There undoubtedly is. And some of its ability is to be able to give you a position above your physical and mental position. It's something that enables the book to lift you into a place where you can see things differently, where you can see them from a different angle. I don't know why that is. Sometimes it because it brings back to you the experience of the words of the man that you're reading. But often it's simply an ability it has to put you in a position of transcendence and to enable you to see things that you don't you wouldn't normally see yourself. So there does seem to be, if you like, a kind of magic in it. And it is important, therefore, when you read it in Bible study or when you read it at any time, to glance up to the Spirit who is beginning to touch you through your just attending to this book. And it is important in that way to lift up a prayer to the Holy Spirit that he will enable you to see what he has for you here. Because often what you do is read words that you've read a thousand times before, you know. But God's Spirit makes them real to you and brings them home to you. And so, in a real way, you seem to stand in the presence of God. So, uh, if you say to me, any of the words, yeah, I mean, I'm so dumb that I take, because I was such a skeptic of this kind of thing, I mean, I, eh, the Word of God, you know, but it, uh, I thought of it primarily as a, a, a literary creation. But uh, for, for whatever reason, it seems that uh, God uh, brings home to my heart that uh, even if the words are simple, I, that's why I did it with Romans, you know. I would take a, you know it yourselves, I would take a verse or I would come to a verse that was not very clever or not very bright or very deep, you know. And I would feel an absolute obligation to give as much attention to that verse as to the deepest verse in the book. So again and again during these, those, whatever they were, 20 years, 30 years, uh, again and again, I would feel an absolute responsibility to take all the words of a simple verse as carefully and, uh, and respectfully as I possibly could and to trust God's Spirit to give me light from them. And of course he did again and again without fail, you know. So it is remarkable that even a verse like Jesus wept, which is pretty deep in its own way, but the many other verses like that that describe just a physical action, it's very important to see God is able to make those light to you. It is a remarkable book. It is a book that is inspired by the power of God's Spirit. It is a book that enables you to see things that you wouldn't normally see. It is a book that enables you to sit on a mountaintop that you aren't on and to see things that you haven't seen before. So it is, in that way, a magical book. It is a sword of the Spirit. 
and you could go forever on the sword of the Spirit, you know, which I won't uh, I barely touch at this moment. I just point out that a sword does cut and split, and it does attack and it does defend, you know, and it is sharp. And that's, of course, what this book is, sharper than any two-edged sword. And, of course, the old story, you know, as you're cutting with the front edge, the back edge is cutting you too, you know. So it is two-edged sword. It's a sword that enables you to stand against the enemy, but it's also a sword that at the same time cuts back and cuts a little slice off you and maybe splits between the soul and the spirit in your own life. So it is... A, uh, you know, magical is not the right word. It's really a godless word, uh, word in a way. But it is a supernatural book. It is undoubtedly God's own word, living and alive, and able to touch you far deeper than your own mind and emotions. So when you go to it, even in an ordinary Bible study each day, it seems to me uh, vital, you know, to bow your head before the Father and to ask him for what he has for you here in this apparently simple, shallow verse that you're reading. Because God will honor that, and he will make it life to you. So that's only part of what it does. It undoubtedly gives you wisdom. It undoubtedly gives you guidance. Uh, if you say to me, do you do John Wesley's? I'm afraid an odd time I do, but I know I shouldn't. And, uh, you know, the, uh, oh, my, my, our, my grandmother, now she, that, she, it ought to be right if she did it. No, she had a Salvation Army, you know, she had a little book of promises, you know what they are? They're little, lots of little squirreled up pieces of paper, you know, and, and she also had forceps, you could pick them up. But Desmond and I love to pick out a promise, you know, from the box of promises in the book. So you can do that. Uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, do I recommend opening the book? No, I don't. I do still do it from time to time, but I don't recommend it. No, I mean, the only way is to apply yourself to his word with lovely, loving respect and discipline and then trust him to speak it to you. Now, in the uh, receiving of it, uh, no, I think you have to be very open to God uh, interpreting the verse to you differently. If you say, is it good practice? No, I think normally it's better to love God with all your heart and soul and strength and mind. And uh, it's better to use your mind to uh, study the verse and to see what the context of it is and to see what it meant in that historical situation. I think that's by far the safest route to go. But there's no doubt that at times, in times of difficulty, in times of uh, trouble, in times of sadness and depression, as well as in times of joy and light, uh, there are times when God's Spirit just takes a verse and and applies it immediately to you and you know it and you just know this verse meant this for me it doesn't normally mean it to others but it meant this to me and then it's important to realize that God is is gently and kindly and graciously speaking to you from his own heart and then it's very important to see that here the book itself fades behind the living word you know that is right beside you Jesus himself and so, uh, undoubtedly, there are times when God speaks to you directly despite the context. But normally, the wise thing is to see the context in which the words are to occur and to see what their application was in that historical time. I think it's, there's not no sense in reading it, but there's virtually no sense in going to it if you don't end up with the vital uh, uh, step of asking God, personally, Lord, is there anything here that you have to say to me, to me personally through this piece? Even after you've studied the verse in the Bible and after you've studied the context and after you've analyzed it and after you've thought about it, it's important at the very end to say, Lord, is there anything that you have to say to me directly here that I have not seen myself? So that it is finally the Lord that you go to not in a way the word in a way it's great to respect the word but really the word is precious because it's god speaking to you 
And that's the most precious thing of all. Now, can you know when God has spoken to you? Well, I think undoubtedly you can, you know, whether it's him speaking to you at the very beginning just because you've read the verse and immediately it comes to your heart or whether it comes through the context or whether it comes at the very end, undoubtedly. You, you, it is his will that you would know what he has said to you there uh, in that situation and that's why you go to it. So. Uh, you could go on forever on the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. I just thought we ought to uh, introduce the whole thing uh, this morning. This is the take for above everything else, the Word of God, uh, the sword of the Spirit. And uh, I just point out to you that you don't need anything more said about the principalities and powers than you see about the mess in Rome, you know. It's just evidence that the whole world is in trouble because of the principalities and powers and the workers of evil in the darkness. And that's why we need to take unto ourselves the uh, armor of God, the whole armor of God. And of course, a great well, you have to say probably the main part of that armor is the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God.